Thank you, Kelsey. We've been taking a look at the highlights in the life and the ministry of Jesus. This morning, we're going to take a look at the second miracle that we've examined. We took a look at Jesus' first miracle at Cana of Galilee, turning water into wine. And this morning, we're going to look at probably the most impressive miracle. And the reason for that being is because it took place in front of so many people, 5,000 plus. We're going to take a look at the feeding of the 5,000. I'm going to teach this morning in a way that I've never taught this before. We've always looked at the event. This morning, we're going to take a look at the people who were there and examine them individually. Jesus retreats to a, a mountainside for much needed R&R. &R. But when he looks up, in the middle of his rest, he sees a crowd coming of 5,000 men, not counting women and children. The crowd has needs. They're all hungry physically and spiritually. And so Jesus feeds them all. That story in just a moment, but as always, before we talk about the son, let's bow our heads and hearts and let's talk to his father first. Father, we come this morning tired and hungry physically and spiritually needing fed. And we thank you that you are a God of provision. And you've been in the habit of feeding your people since the beginning of time. We thank you for all that you do for us and all that you've done for us. We pray as we look at the people surrounding this miracle that we will see and examine ourselves there. And we thank you for the miracles that have taken place in our lives over the years. And we thank you for the ones taking place in our lives right now and the ones that will in the future. We thank you for being a practical God, but we thank you for being a miraculous God too. As we open your word this morning, we ask you to come in a powerful way. We pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins, for they are many. We come to this place this morning to see Jesus of Nazareth and him only. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Follow along with me. John 6, 1 through 13. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great, multi, or a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test Philip, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have one bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all ha had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Now, in just a moment, we're going to take a look at the personalities that were present at this miracle. But before we do that, there are two sore thumbs that stick out of the text that we need to take a look at on the front end. Sore thumb number one, I want you to please note that it's impossible to have a complete picture of Jesus by yourself. Say it again. It's impossible to have a complete picture of Jesus by yourself. In the 25th verse of the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John, John says this. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. In other words, Jesus is a whole lot bigger than any one man's book or vision or thinking. The history, the experiences, the miracles, the stories, the attempted understandings of Jesus are far too vast for any one man to list or to explain. Let me tell you who you ought to watch out for. Beware of the pastor or the believer who acts like they have Jesus in his or her back pocket. 
that they know everything there is to know about Jesus. Because nobody does. He's too big for one person's vision or book or thinking. H.G. Wells said this about Jesus. The Galilean has been too great for our small minds. The Galilean has been too great for our small minds. Jesus was a young man who was born in an obscure village, a child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30, and then for three years he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never owned a home. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place that he was born. He never did one of those things that usually accompanies greatness. He had no credentials but himself. And while he was still a young man, the pride of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away and they left him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to two crossbeams on the town garbage heap between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property that he had on this earth, which was his coat. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Three days later, he conquered death and walked out of that borrowed tomb, becoming the savior of the world. And when I first encountered Jesus, I thought he was just another grain of sand on the endless beaches of eternity. I thought that he was just a man, though a good man, a great teacher, and a nice person who died on a cross as a martyr, but certainly nothing more. But then I met him face to face, and his radiance was something to behold. His death blew my mind, and his resurrection challenged my small thinking. And the work and the ministry of Jesus changed my life. And today, every single day of my life, I see a new facet. I peel back another amazing layer of his majesty. And I see more and more and more of this person that I follow. Jesus is too big for your vision. He's too big for your understanding. He's too big for your thinking. And it's impossible to have a complete picture of who Jesus is all by yourself. All right, so with them number two, I want you to please note the frustrations of ministry when following Jesus Christ. Look at verses three through five. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, get the picture in your mind. Jesus is tired. He's been dealing with large crowds every day from sunup to sundown. He's full of sorrow and grief because this is right after the death of John the Baptist, who's been like a pastor to Jesus. He goes up on a mountainside with his disciples to get away, to get some much-needed R&R. And then after just getting set down, just getting comfortable, he looks up, and here comes a great crowd of over 5,000 people. The blind, being helped by others, stumbling up the mountain, calling out his name, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. The crippled, hobbling along on crutches, some being carried carried in on stretchers by their friends. Those whose bodies were twisted and deformed. The deaf and the mute, the lepers who were crying out, unclean, unclean, as they stagger up the mountainside. The hurt and the empty and the lonely and the afraid and the guilty. And Jesus doesn't run or hide. He looks at his disciples and he says, the R&R is over, guys. And he begins to meet the needs one by one of this great crowd. When some people start following Jesus, they do it with a vision that is admirable and quite good. They say, I want to conquer the world for Christ. I want to serve and never look back. I want to stand for him and stand for him and stand for him. I'll even die for him if that's what he asked me to do. And that's good. That's exciting. But let me tell you what real commitment is. Real commitment is following Jesus Christ and being tired and frustrated and irritated and inconvenienced. Let me say it again. Real commitment is following Jesus Christ and being tired and frustrated and irritated and inconvenienced and giving everything that you've got no matter what. I don't know about you, but I could never find a story in the Bible where God asked somebody to do less, only more. Sometimes we don't want to serve because we're tired, hurting, sick, brokenhearted. But when we see the needs of people who come, we got to serve anyway because we don't represent ourselves, we represent Him.
I had a worship leader one time who came in early on Sunday morning for praise team practice. He came to me and he said, I'm not going to lead worship this morning in the services. I'm just not feeling it. And I said, excuse me? He said, I'm not going to lead. I said, yeah, I heard that part. Tell me again why you're not going to lead worship this morning. And I had no other substitute. He said, again, I'm just not feeling it. And I said, feeling what? He said, well, I'm just not feeling like being up there this morning. I said to him, do you think that over the past 28 years there haven't been Sundays when I don't feel like being up here? There have been Sundays when I've been sick, strep throat, 104 degree fever. I've been down or discouraged, broken hearted, facing tragedy. And I hadn't felt like being up here either. But I served anyway because it's not about me, it's about him. It's not about how I feel. It's about the calling that's been placed on my life and the commitment to serving him. And he said, well, I'm not going to lead. I'm just not feeling it. I said, there are 500 people counting on you this morning. I said, if you walk off the stage, don't come back. Because if I can't count on you, then God can't count on you either. And there may be times in your future when you're not feeling it either. And he never led worship for me again. Jesus was willing to put aside how he felt and minister to the needs of of others who came. And that's what he's called us to do. He didn't concentrate on how he felt. He concentrated on the people who came. And that gives us great confidence that Jesus knows how we feel and what we're going through too. Did you see that stuff coming out of the sky yesterday? It looked like the stuff that comes out of your faucet. It was the first time it's rained since uh, Oktoberfest weekend. They say this could be the driest October in the history of Indiana. But do you remember back in May? May was the wettest May ever in the history of Indiana. I remember back then the ground was so saturated with water. Lev and I, one day on our day off on Monday, we were headed north to Indianapolis going to Greenwood. We were going north on I-65 and we looked across at the southbound lane and there was a car over there and we could see that the wheels were spinning. And there was, looked like a family that was out by the car. They'd gotten off the concrete shoulder into the dirt. And it was mud. It wasn't dirt anymore. It was so saturated. And three were pushing and one was driving. And we were headed northbound and we went on to Greenwood. We went to the mall. We made some other stops we needed to make. We had lunch. And we were coming back about four hours later. And when we got to that place in the southbound lane where we'd seen that car, it was still there four hours later. And this Hispanic family was standing out by the car. And so we were in the truck. We pulled over, and I backed up, and I went up, and I said, can I help you? And we had a small problem with conversation because they didn't speak much English, and I didn't speak much Spanish. And I said to them, do you need a, a phone? And they were from out of town. They didn't know anybody in the area. And their problem was that they didn't have any money. I said, do you need a phone to call somebody for help? And they said, no, no, no money. And I said, well, is there anything wrong with your car? And he said, no, they were just stuck. And I said, well, do you want me to pull you out? And he said, no, no, no money. I said, it won't cost you anything. And so I backed the truck up, opened up the toolbox, got a tow strap out, put it on their bumper, put it on my hitch, and I pulled them back up onto the concrete portion of the shoulder. Now, wait a minute, that's not right. Jesus in me pulled them out of the mud and back onto the shoulder I wanted to pass them by like I'd done on the way up. The phone rang at home Thursday night about 10.30. I was in the office working on this sermon. It was a young man that I barely knew who had just caught his wife cheating on him for the third time in less than a year. He talked, and I mostly listened I tried to encourage him the best that I could. I I prayed with him, and we talked till almost midnight. No, wait a minute. That's not right. Jesus in me talked till almost midnight. I wanted to finish this sermon and go to bed. Last week, I was driving home on Tipton Street in a semi. I came off the interstate and didn't stop. It came across two lanes of traffic, cutting me off. I slammed on the brakes, went into the median with two tires. He pulled into the turn lane to go into McDonald's. I pulled up beside him at the light and just smiled and waved. No, that's not right. Jesus in me smiled and waved. I wanted to make an obscene gesture. You see, Matthew 25 is a haunting scripture to me. It's the story of judgment where Jesus condemns the unrighteous. And he says, I was hungry. 
and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a drink. I was poor and homeless, and you didn't care about me. I was a stranger, and you ignored me. I was sick and in prison, and you never came or cared about me. And we'll say, when, Jesus? When were you ever hungry or thirsty or poor or homeless or sick or in prison? And I didn't care. I don't remember ever seeing you. And if I had, I wouldn't have ignored you, Jesus. And he will say, whatever you did not do for the least of my people, you did not do for me. Real commitment is following Christ and playing the game hurt. Real commitment is following Christ and being frustrated and irritated and inconvenienced and tired. You see, he was rich and he became poor. He was the king and he became a servant. He had everything and he gave it up to come here and have nothing so that for our sake, he might become frustrated and irritated and inconvenienced and tired that your needs and my needs might be met. All right, with those appetizers out of the way, onto the main course. The personalities present at this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Please note that this is probably the most impressive miracle ever performed by Jesus in his three year ministry. One reason is because of the logistics of it. One little boy's lunch, five barley loaves and two fish, is multiplied to the point that it feeds well over 5,000 people. Another reason is because this miracle is seen and witnessed by more people than any other. Well over 5,000 people who were there and who were fed. And this is the only miracle of Jesus that makes it into all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so very quickly, I want to examine five personalities that were there who witnessed this great miracle. Let's check them out. First of all, I want you to note the crowd that came. And they were geared to the practical. Verse 5, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him. Jesus and his disciples set sail for Capernaum to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is a distance of about four miles. This crowd had been watching with amazement and astonishment. Everything that Jesus did, they saw his miracles, they saw his healings, and they didn't want him to get out of their sight. And so he set sail from Capernaum, and they follow him. It was easy, easy to see the direction the boat was taking from the shore, and so they just take off on foot across the land around the top of the lake so that they could catch up with him on the other side. Now, let's quickly jump down for a moment to the 66th verse of this chapter. It wasn't in what we read, but it's part of this chapter. Follow along with me, verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples, and that word means followers, many of his followers turned back and no longer followed him. Jesus has just delivered, prior to verse 66, a hard message of truth about what it takes to follow him. It's the speech that separates the men from the boys. And verse 66 says that after that speech, many of those following him turned back and no longer followed him. Do you see it? You see what's going on here? There's no faith on the part of the crowd. And what little faith they may have had was fickle faith. When it begins to cost them something to follow Jesus, they turn and walk away. In other words, these people were following Jesus as long as he did what they wanted him to do. As long as he was healing them and feeding them and performing miracles in their presence, they were right on his heels. But less than a chapter away, when following him began to cost them something, they all turned and walked away. Listen, if it doesn't cost you anything, it's not worth anything. If it doesn't cost you anything, it's not worth anything. If it doesn't cost you of your time and of your talents and your money, even your reputation, then it's simply not worth anything. Now, don't get me wrong, some of the crowd stayed and followed him because practicality gives way to belief. Practicality gives way to belief. Kind of like a, a heart attack leads you to believe you should have lost weight. Your need will bring you to Jesus, and the love and the compassion you find there will keep you following him. You know, people come to church, a lot of them, for the first time when their lives are falling apart. And that's okay, because you see, God will not create for you a life that makes him unnecessary. And sometimes your life falling apart is the only thing that brings you to Jesus. This crowd was no different. The only thing that brought them to Jesus was their tremendous need, their need to be healed physically and spiritually. You know, I think it's interesting to note that Jesus fed them. He didn't have to. They wouldn't have starved to death missing one meal. But let me tell you why he fed them. He fed them because they expected it. They expected Messiah to meet all of their needs, whether it was healing or hunger. After all, his father had been meeting their needs for centuries. 
He'd fed them every day for 40 years in the desert with manna on the ground. Aren't you glad that we have a God that meets needs? Not just spiritual needs, but physical needs as well. A God who's not just concerned about your salvation, but he's concerned about your hunger. He's concerned about what's in your cupboard. He's concerned about your clothes and your mortgage and your car payment. All right, secondly, I want you to see not only the crowd, but let's take a look at Philip who was there, and he was geared to the problem. Verse 7, Philip answered him, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Once again, Jesus is being practical because Philip is from this area. He's asking a, a homeboy, where can we get something to eat around here? But Philip isn't looking at the situation through the eyes of faith. Philip has his calculator out, and he's figuring the cost of a minimal box lunch times 5,000 plus women plus children, delivery fees, clean up. You see, Philip is so geared to the problem of an impossible situation that he doesn't even know that Jesus is testing his faith. Look at verses 5b through 6. Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Jesus asks this only to test Philip, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. You see it? Jesus already knew the solution to the problem. He was the solution to the problem. But he wanted to see if Philip knew that he was the solution to the problem. Philip had seen Jesus perform miracle after miracle, but he still didn't have the faith to believe in Jesus as the solution to this impossible situation. Somebody said an optimist is a person who does a crossword puzzle in ink. Well, that wouldn't have been Philip. Philip didn't have the confidence or the faith in him or in Jesus to do anything in ink. And most of the time, we're that way too. We give up immediately when we face a seemingly impossible situation because we're looking through the eyes of defeat instead of looking through the eyes of faith. We see things in the natural instead of in the supernatural. We see what we can't do instead of what God can do. You see, our problem is bigger than our faith. Tampa, Florida is the lightning capital of the world. There are more lightning strikes there per square mile than any other place on earth. And as you know, along with lightning comes thunder. When we moved to Tampa in 1991, our boys were young. Stevie was just a baby. And there was an adjustment period for them to all the thunder and lightning that came with the frequent storms. I can remember on numerous occasions our first year there, putting the boys to bed, and Lev and I would be watching TV in the living room, and we would hear a storm approaching. And as the storm moved in from the coast, the lightning strikes got near, and the thunder got louder. And then all of a sudden, lightning would strike near the house, and the darkness outside would turn to daylight. And a second or two later, the thunder would just boom and literally shake the house and rattle the windows. And then it would be like a scene out of The Sound of Music, where three little heads would pop out from around the corner. And my boys would run to where I was sitting and pile into my lap with my arms around them until the storm was over. And many times since those days, the Father has reminded me that just like the thunder and lightning, the storms and trials that come into my life are given to me to force me into the arms of my Father. All right, thirdly, I want you to see not only the crowd and Philip, but let's take a look at Andrew who was there. And he was geared to the possibilities. Verses 8 and 9. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Once again, we see Andrew bringing somebody to Jesus. And this time it's a little boy. A little boy who wants to offer his lunch and help feed the multitude of over 5,000. It's not much, but Andrew takes the little boy to Jesus because Andrew knows that with Jesus, a little can become a lot. Andrew was always bringing people to Jesus. He was always seeing the glass half full instead of half empty. Why? Because he knew Jesus. And he knew that with Jesus, he had hope. Unlike Philip, who was geared to the problem and had his calculator out trying to figure out how much money it was going to cost, Andrew's geared to the possibilities. And he takes a little boy's lunch to Jesus because he knows what Jesus can do with it. You see, Andrew remembers Jesus turning 180 gallons of water into 180 gallons of wine. 
He remembers blind men who beheld their first sunset because Jesus passed by. He remembers crutches and stretchers along the road that used to belong to the lame and the cripple who walked away because they'd gotten next to Jesus. And Andrew knew there was hope in any impossible situation as long as Jesus was there. Have you invited Jesus into your impossible situation? Do you have a a problem so impossible, maybe like feeding 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch, so impossible that only a miracle could solve it? And I'm sitting here looking or standing here looking out at people that I know are praying for a miracle. Have you taken your problem to Jesus? And if you haven't, why not? Where else are you going to take it? You see, Andrew was geared to the possibilities. Not just because of the miracles that he'd seen Jesus perform, but because of what he knew. Andrew was a man of the book. And he knew from Scripture that impossible situations were nothing for God. He remembered the Red Sea parting and three million of his ancestors walking across on dry ground. He remembered Jericho, the city that nobody could take down, and they took it down with trumpets and a shout. He remembers David and Goliath and Daniel and the lion's den. And Andrew remembered his brother Peter. I mean, you talk about a miracle. You talk about an impossible situation. Jesus had taken Peter's life and turned it upside down. He had touched Peter's heart, and he had changed Peter's life, and he made him a lightning bolt in the hand of God. Do you have a mountain that needs to be moved? Andrew would tell you to take it to Jesus. Do you have an impossible situation? Andrew would tell you, get Jesus involved. Fourthly, I want you to see not only the crowd and Philip and Andrew, but I want you to know the little boy. And he's geared to the plan. Verse 9a, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. You know one of the great things about the Bible? There are so many people in it that are used in a great way, and we don't even know their names. And this little boy is one of those. And that's because God is trying to teach us that it's not important that others know our name. It's important only that he knows our name. Now, there are only two things that we know definitely about this little boy. First of all, in the Greek, it's a double diminutive that's used in reference to him so that we know he's a very little boy. And secondly, we read that his lunch consisted of barley loaves, so we know that he's poor because barley bread was the food of the poor. He's a little boy, and he's poor. He was too little to know how big the problem really was. He wasn't smart enough to know that you can't feed 5,000 people with so little. He just didn't have the sophistication to understand that you got to have big solutions for big problems. He was simply little and poor. He looked at the problem, and he took what he had to Jesus. And we can learn a lot from this little boy. In C.S. Lewis's book, Of Other Worlds, there's an essay on writing for children. I want to read you just a quote from C.S. Lewis, and I recommend anything he ever wrote. This is what he says. To be concerned about being grown up, to blush at the suspicion of being childish, these things are the marks of childhood and adolescence. When I was 10, I read fairy tales in secret and would have been ashamed if I had been found doing so. Now that I'm 50... I read them openly. When I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. What was he saying? He was saying the same thing that Jesus said in Matthew 18 when he called a little child into the midst of the disciples. And he said, truly I say unto you, unless you become like one of these, like a child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I remember the house that I grew up in down on Elm Street in Brownstown. Everything was so big in that house, the rooms, the kitchen, the stairway, the yard. But as I kept coming home over the years after I left, everything got smaller and smaller and smaller than I remembered. And I suppose as you get bigger, other things seem smaller too. One poor little boy, the only one in the crowd that was willing to share what he had, maybe if we would become small again, and poor enough, then Jesus will be big enough to do something about our problem. And then fifthly and finally, and very quickly, I want you to note not only the crowd and Philip and Andrew and the little boy, but I want you to note, last of all, Jesus. And he was geared to the people. Verse 11, Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. Once again, Jesus did things that only Messiah could do. 
He was meeting the needs of the people. You can't explain this miracle in any other way except Messiah was there. Immediately following this, Satan tries to steal the faith of the disciples with a storm out on the sea. And as the waves increase, their fear increases even more. But do you know what they were overlooking in the boat in the middle of the storm? They were overlooking the 12 basketfuls of leftovers that should have reminded them of God's faithfulness in the last impossible situation they'd faced just an hour or so ago. Do you remember God's faithfulness in the past? Then you should expect God's faithfulness in the present and in the future. Let me finish with this. I want you to look with me in closing at the practicality of Jesus. Look at John 6, 10a. Jesus said, have the people what? Sit down. Have the people sit down. Somebody tells the story about a missionary whose job it was to feed all the hungry people who came to the mission every day. And there were so many, and they were so hungry and pushing so hard that he simply couldn't get them all fed. And then one evening, he opened his Bible to this sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, and he read where Jesus told the multitude that he was about to feed to sit down, sit down. And he said to himself, you know, that's it. That's it. You can't push if you're sitting down. You can't fight if you're sitting down. You can't shove somebody if you're sitting down. And so the next day, when all of these people came to be fed, he said, sit down. And they sat down. And for the first time, all of them got enough to eat. That's practical. That's just common sense. And I'm glad that Jesus is that way, aren't you? Because that means that he's practical about the needs of my family. That means he's practical about your mortgage payment. He's practical about the balance in your checkbook, your job, the girl you're dating, the guy that you love. He's practical about dirty diapers and dirty dishes and all of your bills. He's that kind of God. He's practical, but he's miraculous too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that we see that Paul talks about in Philippians 2, both sides of you. That Jesus was truly human and truly divine. And that means that he not only understood from the throne of heaven, but he understood from the floor of a stable. He understood our problems. He came and lived in the neighborhood next to us so that he could identify with everything that we would ever face. And when he saw that sin had gotten the best of it, he went to Calvary in our place. We love you and we thank you for a practical God. And we thank you that you're a miraculous God as well. In Jesus' name.